Routers are one of the most versatile tools in the shop, and as you can see, I have a lot of them. Recently, we released a video about template tips and tricks, and I realized from the comments that a lot of you may be either scared of the router or don't know enough about them uh, to really even get to that step. So I wanted to start from the beginning and talk about tips and tricks for beginning to use the router. And I wanted to give you some buying advice. As you can see, I have bought a lot of routers. These are, don't even include the one that's in my router table. So um, I know a lot about routers. I use them on a daily basis. We use them in the production side of our business, which you never see on the YouTube channel. And we use it in all of our projects. So uh, if you want to get to the buying advice portion of this video, Mark will put the timestamp right here or here or here and you can skip ahead to that portion of the video. So let's get into the basics and talk about the two different types of routers. So there's two basic types of routers and three ways to use them. You first have your palm routers, which are usually about one horsepower, and then you have your bigger routers, which are gonna be you know, in the two to three and a quarter horsepower range. And then the three ways to use them are in a fixed base, like these two here, a plunge base, like these two here, or a router table with a router lift. The router lift fits into the fixed base category because you can't plunge a router lift. You could lift it up, but it's not how you wanna be using it. The difference is, and, and they both have great uses. I mean, buying a bigger router won't always replace a palm router, and you can't use a palm router for some of the things you can use a bigger router for. A palm router is great for doing edge work, roundovers, chamfers, uh, you can sort of get away if you take small bites, doing long dado cuts, that kind of thing, dados and rabbits. Whereas a larger router can flatten slabs, it can do dados, rabbits, edge work. It can do almost all of the things that a palm router can do. A palm router is a great luxury because it's very simple, fits in the palm of your hand, it's very easy to do light work with. The biggest differences about them is a palm router, or a small router is only gonna come with a quarter inch collet whereas a larger router is gonna come with a quarter inch and a half inch collet. Now, let me show you the difference between those two. So this is the difference between a quarter inch and a half inch collet. Any larger router you buy will have both. So these are interchangeable, they just come off and you could put on a quarter inch collet, whereas any small router will not come with a half inch bit because the horsepower is not enough to turn this effectively. Now, the biggest difference between that and why these are so much more valuable to have is if you look at the size of a quarter inch versus a half inch shank, the forces that you exert on a piece of wood when you're routing are intense and can be very, very strong. So the flex that can come into play when you're using a quarter inch collet is massively, massively weaker than when you're using a half inch shank. Now, a lot of bits are easier to use in a quarter inch shank like small eighth inch roundovers or quarter inch up cut, down cut spiral bits, but you can easily do those with a bigger router. I always, always, always try to buy my bits in half inch shank when available because there is a very noticeable difference when you're cutting, how much of a bite you can take. So you can take deeper, thicker cuts with a half inch collet as opposed to a quarter inch collet. So in my opinion, half inch shanks are a lot easier to use, but some bits, like very small bits if you're doing sign making or freehand lettering, that kind of thing are only gonna come in a quarter inch caught. Okay, so we're here at the table saw because this is the most important part and this is the analogy that works for me. I've drawn arrows on my router to show you the direction that the router bit spins. Now the way that this works, and I've drawn it for you, is when you are using your router handheld, when it is right side up, the correct side up, is what we'll say right side up means, your bit is going clockwise. When it is upside down, like in a router table, your bit is going counterclockwise. So this is the same exact thing as a table saw versus a skill saw. When you are at your table saw, your skill saw is upside down and you're pushing your workpiece into the teeth. When you're using a skill saw, it is right side up and you are pushing your tool into the workpiece. So the way this works is you always wanna be cutting against the teeth. You would never feed a workpiece into a table saw from this direction. It would grab your workpiece and shoot it out of your hand. Same thing with a router bit. You always wanna work opposite the way that it is spinning. So when it is a, when you're using it as a handheld router, you're going to work your router on the right side of your piece and push away from yourself. When it is upside down on a router table, you're gonna put your workpiece on the left side of the bit and push the workpiece away from yourself. 
So hopefully that makes sense. We're gonna move on to the second most important part of using a router safely, and that is depth of cut. Now we talked about this a little bit in the template video uh, about template routing, but the second most important thing about using a router safely and effectively is your depth of cut. In my opinion, you never wanna be taking more than half the diameter of the shank at a time. There's some exceptions to that, but I promise you, 99,999 times out of 10,000, if your router jumps out of your hands, it's because it's trying to take too much material. You always wanna remove as much material as possible for things like a dovetail cut, or if you were doing a dado, you would wanna go a quarter inch at a time if you were using a half inch shank, or an eighth inch at a time if you were using a quarter inch shank, or something like a chamfer bit. These are both white side chamfer bits that I got from Bits Bits, but, if you can see, this is a quarter inch shank, so I wouldn't do more than an eighth inch chamfer at a time, and you can do that by lowering your, or raising your bit or lowering your bit, depending on which orientation you're using it in, and continuing your, your chamfer. Uh, you're gonna get a lot less tear out that way, you're gonna get a much cleaner cut, no chatter, and of course, more, most dangerously, is you're not gonna break bits. So if I was gonna try and take this entire, it looks like about an inch and a quarter chamfer, I would do that in three or four passes. And if I was gonna try and take this entire chamfer, I'd probably do that in three passes is what it looks like. Cause you know, the flex in the bit, if you try and take too much material on a quarter inch shank versus a half inch shank, like we talked about before is really intense. Now here's something that took me a long time to learn, which is because it's a dovetail bit, obviously you can't take multiple passes or you're just gonna have a, even with dado instead of a dovetail, I've snapped a ton of dovetail bits. And what, it took me a little while, in fact, Sean Boyd taught me this, which is instead of just trying to power through that cut, what I would do is mark out where my dovetail is gonna be and then I would use a table saw to remove as much of that material as possible. In fact, all the way to the width of the smallest part of the dovetail, I would cut all that out with a table saw or a straight bit on my router before I would attempt to cut the dovetail. One of the, the best ways to accomplish this when you're doing straight bits or even a bearing based bit and you wanna get a huge edge profile is to use a plunge based router. Now the way a plunge based router works is you lock your router in there and you can move your router up and down. So let me show you how to repeatably and accurately set your depth of cut for multiple depths. Quick little aside before we get into this, when you're putting a router bit in a collet, you never want more than half the shank outside of the collet. So what I just do, I usually bottom it out uh, or take it out just a little bit to if the cutters go down below the collet, because you don't want to dull your cutters. Not that you would ever use that whole cutting surface at a time, but and then you just tighten it in. So never more than half of your shank outside of the collet. When you're setting your depth for multiple plunges with a plunge router, there are something that all plunge bases have in common, whether using a small or a big router, and that is these stop rods and these turrets with different stops on them. And on a small router, to go back to what I was saying about never go more than the thickness of your shank, I'm sorry, than half the thickness on your shank, the small router has eighth inch steps and the big router has quarter inch steps because this would use a half inch bit and a quarter inch bit. There are two ways to set your depth. First is you have a known distance that you want to go down. Let's say you have you want to go down exactly a quarter inch. This is a quarter inch setup rod. You could cut these out of wood. No big deal. The way that you would set a known distance, let's call it a half an inch here so we have to do multiple stops. So I'm going to set my turret on its smallest, on its deepest stop. So I'm going to bring my piece down to the wood here, lock it off so we know that that is zero. And then I'm gonna take a half inch, a known measurement, it could be any measurement, and put it over that stop and bring my rod down to it. I'm gonna press that down, tighten my rod, and now we know that when we plunge that down, we're gonna go down exactly half an inch. However, we don't wanna make a half an inch pass at a time. So we're gonna move our collet one click, and now we know that we're only gonna go down a quarter inch the first time. We're gonna make a pass, and then we're gonna switch it back to the original stop that we had, and we're gonna go down to there. So the way that looks from the top of the router, so right now we are at zero, that was the zero that we set, and we're gonna click our turret back one stop there, we're gonna turn our router on, and we're gonna plunge down to our first stop, and lock it off, and make our pass. And as you can see, that's half the distance of our block. Then, we're gonna unlock it, 
turn our router off. We're gonna move our collet to the deepest one and we're gonna plunge down again, lock it off and make our pass. And as you can see, we're right there at our half inch mark. In fact, if I look at it, I'm a little bit over and that's something that you'd wanna check and it's very easy to adjust. All lock rods on a plunge base router are gonna have these micro adjusts. So you can spin it away or towards if you need to just get a little bit more or a little bit less. Very, very easy to adjust. A plunge base is definitely my most used base. A, whereas a fixed base is gonna be used for making repeatable cuts of the same thing uh, where you don't need to adjust it. All right, let's talk about the different kinds of bits. Now, essentially there's two types of bits. You could maybe split them into three categories, but the two are bits with bearings on them and bits without bearings on them. Bearing bits are designed to follow an edge to create either a profile or exactly match that edge, like the flush trim bits that we talked about in the template routing video, or these are edge profile bits. This is a quarter inch round over, uh, a quarter inch shank chamfer bit and a half inch shank chamfer bit. The other types of bits, which I would probably split into two categories are straight bits and bits that have a shape to them. Now bits that have a shape to them are usually the ones where you wanna remove material with either a blade or a cutter before you start using them because you're gonna to want to create that profile once and only make one pass. Now I, I get all my bits from bitsandbits.com. There's a discount code down below. Now here's my buying advice about bits. Only, only get the bits you need. I have probably more than I care to admit in my case that I have never used. Like I've never used this keyhole bit. I've never used that dovetail bit. And it's an embarrassing waste of money. Router bits can be expensive. And one of the things that I suggest to newbies is only buy the bits you need. And your router bit is not dull. It just needs to be cleaned. Get Simple Green. Simple Green is the best blade and cutter cleaner. Like you can see this bit here, I've used it to do a ton of template routing with some sappy wood. And there's just a little sap build up there. That will come off with a little Simple Green. You just soak it for about five minutes, spray it one more time and just wipe it off. Make sure you don't go the direction of the cutter, which is a mistake I have made more times than I care to admit. Um, so that's my buying advice for router bits. Only get what you need. The higher quality bit, the longer it's gonna last. You do what you gotta do, but use that discount code at Bits Bits. They're, they're awesome. So let's talk about how to use these bits and avoid tear out, which is the scourge of routing is tear out. That's the number one problem. Now, when it comes to avoiding tear out, there's a couple ways to avoid it. One, of course, as I said before, is take very small bites. Small passes leads to better cuts, cleaner cuts, less burning. And if you try and hog out a ton of material with a router, you're just gonna have either unsafe conditions or you're gonna have a terrible looking cut. The other thing that happens when you're using a router is you get tear out when you're doing edge profiling. Now the easiest way to do that is cut against the grain first. Now this is a quarter inch cut and I'm in a large router that I've used a ton so I know that I can take this pass all at once and get an edge profile, however, if I was doing a ton of this, I might back this off an eighth of an inch and do all my edges and then come back and do the full pass, especially if I was using a palm router. So let me give you an example of this. What I'm gonna do is route my edge grain first and you'll see I'm gonna get some tear out here, but then I'm gonna do my long grain and that's gonna fix it because the tear out's not going to be above where the bit is gonna cut. Now you can see we've gotten some tear out here. Like, look at that, that's pretty ugly. And the reason is because wood fibers run this way, hence long grain and end grain. And so when you get to the end and it's unsupported, you can get tear out. And so quick fix is we're just gonna run the long grain now, which is why we always do end grain first. Now you can see we have a perfect corner without any tear out. So let me show you another way when you're doing profiling to avoid tear out. Now another great way to avoid tear out is using a backer board. Now this would be, let's pretend this is my fence. I would take a scrap piece that is as tall as at least the cutter that I'm using and just run it behind. And now that would obviously be an unsafe cut against a fence, so you would wanna use a miter gauge. But I'm gonna show you how this works just freehand because I don't wanna take the time to set up my fence, which is why we're building a router table which will be out a week from now next Sunday. 
So now you can see here we have a completely tear out free cut. Okay, let's head back over to the bench and talk about some buying advice. Okay, let's talk about what I have, mistakes I've made, and what I would recommend. Now, I have three levels of router. I've got a palm router, a fixed and plunge base, a medium duty router, and a heavy duty router. Now, I made some big mistakes buying routers, which is probably why I have so many. First off, my first router, I bought the Bosch Colt, which was uh, one horsepower there. Now all the little ones are 1.25 horsepower. Big mistake. That kit now is going for $144, whereas the two and a quarter horse Bosch kit is going for $189. The other thing that I didn't like about this was the collet broke after about a year's worth of use. Uh, which is not typical of Bosch. Bosch is known for their routers, so maybe I just had a bad experience. But it came with this chintzy edge guide. I ended up spending another $40 for an edge guide. So I made the mistake of trying to save 40 bucks and getting something that was way underpowered and did half the tasks that I needed it to do. The second router I bought was the Triton three and a quarter horse, which is currently going for $265. Now I got that because I was so bummed out that I bought this small router that I thought I should just get the biggest one on the market. Now, that has its place and all the companies make a big router. One of the things that Triton did that is incredible is they made it so that you can put it in a router table as it is. So all you need to do is buy the $50 Craig router table plate and it's ready to go in a router table. They have a lot of really fine adjustability features in it that are great. Some of their parts are very chintzy, like the locking mechanism vibrates loose on my router table about every two weeks and I have to go looking for this teeny little screw. I've had to reorder it several times. Uh, the power switch on it broke. So as far as like heavy, heavy duty routers go that are gonna save you money, Triton is a good choice because you can just put it straight to a router table without having to buy another router lift, which, you know, these can get expensive. This one was like 400 bucks. They go down to like $189. And I know that a lot of companies make a add-on router lift for their router, so you can search that. So. Uh, Triton, I do enjoy it. For flattening slabs, this thing is a beast. You can take massive cuts with a huge bit and get it done really fast. Uh, it's now kind of become that's all I use it for because other than that, I'm never really hogging out material with my router like we've been talking about all, all videos. You want to take small passes. So other than for flattening slabs and doing really big jobs, I don't use that that often. The one that I am very, very happy with is the DeWalt DW618. In fact, I have two of them. This one's gonna go in our new router table because I love it so much. Everything on them is well built, high quality stuff, and it's only $186 for this kit as you see here. It doesn't come with the edge guide. I ended up buying one aftermarket, which I think was about 30, 40 bucks, but that's definitely worth it. Uh, there's tons of accessories for it, just like the Bosch or the Makitas. You know, you, uh, we're all fanboys of certain brand. So whichever one is in the two and a quarter horsepower range, if you're only going to buy one, that's what I'd recommend. It's, it's heavy duty enough that it's going to get anything done that you need it to. It has a half inch collet, a quarter inch collet. Um, then your second router should be a palm router. Now I love this battery powered one because I never have to plug it in. I keep a eighth inch round over bit in it at all times and I can just run around and it's just super easy to turn on. It's nice and quiet and it's very easy to control. And with the battery, actually, it's heavy enough that it really feels like it's not gonna go anywhere. So typically people make the mistake of buying the smallest router first because it's cheaper by about 40 bucks and then moving up to a bigger router and then you just basically have two routers that do the same thing. If you're gonna buy a palm router, whether it's plug-in or battery, you don't need the plunge base because you're never gonna need to use it if you have the bigger one with the plunge base. Just get the fixed base, throw a round over or a chamfer bit, whatever you prefer for breaking edges and keep it in there all the time. It's real easy to use. They're about a hundred bucks. The battery one's about 125. Um, but either way, it's a good second router to have. First router should always be a medium duty one. Um, DeWalt I can highly recommend. I haven't used Bosch before. Like I said, I didn't have the greatest experience with their small one. However, it, it was a workhorse for me. It did get a lot of stuff done. So uh, maybe it broke because I was trying to get it to do too heavy duty of stuff. Make sure that you can get accessories for your router because you will want to expand it in the future. Uh, things like bushings are really great for tracing things when you don't have the ability to template route them. And there's lots of different ways you can do it. When you get into router tables and router table lifts, there are very nice router lifts like this. Rockler makes an amazing one that won an award last year. These Jessam ones are great. Uh, Woodpecker makes one. In fact, if you look at them, they all kind of look the same. They're probably manufactured in the same place, but 
I don't know. Um, but you can get different levels of them down to about $189 all the way up to 400 bucks, I think is the most expensive ones. Summarizing, get a medium duty kit first for about, a, should only spend about $185, then go with a palm router, anywhere from 79, uh, which is, I believe the Bosch Colt, you can get $79 with just the fixed base to $123 for a battery powered one. And then if you're doing a ton of really heavy duty work, like slab work, that kind of thing, then you'd want to get like a three, three and a quarter horsepower router. Or if you want to skip buying the router lift and you really want a router table, uh, Triton's a great one because it, it comes with everything you need to set up in a router table except for the plate that you would get from Craig. That's the extent of sort of basic router tips, tricks, and buying advice that I can offer you. Uh, this is the second video in a series about routers that is going to culminate in a router table uh, build that we have coming out that's going to be really cool with all the bells and whistles. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, please head over to the Cat's Moses store, pick up a stop block, a dovetail jig, or a t-shirt. really helps out. Stay safe in the shop and have a wonderful day. God, it's actually turning into a hot day. This vest is killing me, but I want to keep continuity. In fact, I'm, <laughs> I'm really invested in this. Oh, God.